I want to talk about something. Uh, wa- uh, it's called Walking Together is the title. This whole month, we're, g- we're going to be talking about relationships. So we're going to be talking about uh, walking together and doing relationships. Okay? And um, I want to get to the point right away. The point is this, is that we, we were never meant to do life alone. We're all, we, we were meant to do things together. And uh, the Bible is very clear about that. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 25. The writer Hebrews says, and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. All right? We we need to be encouraging one another. We need to be uh, building one another up. Coming to church or going to a small group isn't just about listening to the preacher or getting together and worshiping God. It's about taking the time to encourage and build up and edify one another. I want you to look to the person beside you and say, I'm here to encourage you today. Amen? And as, as the, uh, the day is drawing near uh, the Christ's return, we understand that there, there's, a, there, there's a need to because the world actually is, is kind of moving farther and farther away from the cross. And so we need to encourage one another because we live in a corrupted culture and we need to encourage one another. Stay strong. Stay close to God, okay? And so I believe that the most important thing to God is that we love one another. I really believe that. I believe that we need to learn to love one another. We need to care for one another as the body of Christ. It doesn't mean we have to agree with everyone's lifestyle or worldview, but we need to love one another genuinely from the heart. Amen? And the Bible says that the love of God was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit when he came in. So we've got this love package. We've got, this, we've got the love of God, for God is love. We're able to love one another. And that's what God has called us to do, to genuinely care for one another. And I believe that this is so important to Jesus that even as we read his last words, which are in the form of a prayer, he's praying for his disciples, right, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he says, now I'm going to pray for all those who are going to believe the testimony of, the, uh, of these disciples. Then he begins to pray for us. And I want to look at that in John chapter 17, verse 20. I'm praying not only for the disciples, but also for those who will ever believe in me through their message. I want you to say, that's me. So Jesus is talking about us here. Next verse. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, talking to the Father, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. There's something about unity when, when, when Christians love one another across denominations. Uh, we might not ag- agree fully on all the interpretations of the minor doctrines, but when the church sees, hey, they don't fully agree on everything, but they love one another. And I think that what the enemy wants to do is bring division in the church so the world will not look and say, hey, God is surely with these people. All right? We see how important this is. Look in verse 22. I have given them the glory you gave me. You know, we hear this statement a lot that God will share his glory with no one. Well, that's actually not true because he shared it. Say, he shares it with me. He's in you. It's the glory of God that he shares with you. And look, look why he shares it. It says right here, I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, may they experience such perfect Unity. The glory of God was given to us so that we would be one with one another. Because the glory of God, the very presence of God, which is really the Spirit of God, gives us the love to love one another. And, and, and this is what happened when, when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist. He came up and the heavens opened. And the Spirit descended as a dove. And what did it say? He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And I believe that when you accept Jesus, God is echoing from heaven, this is my beloved daughter, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. God has opened the heavens. He's given us his glory because the Spirit of God has come into us, amen, so that we can be one. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring us into unity, just like the Trinity, amen? Is that clear? The Scripture is very clear about that, all right? Now, 
The world will know that you sent me, he's saying it again, and that you love them as much as you love me. And, and that's what the world has to say. Hey, there's something about these Christians. They're shining. They're, they love one another. They don't always agree, but they seem to be able to get along. How many hear what I'm saying? And, and they're, they're, they find their identity in God, and they're not struggling with rejection and all these, these things that other people struggle because they find their identity. Why? Because the Spirit of God comes and makes us one. That's what the purpose of the Spirit does. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, okay? Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we, we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. And, and I, I'm amazed when I think about this. If you think about Jesus, he's hanging on the cross. He's been rejected. He's been spit on. He's been beaten. He's been mocked. He's been called a criminal. And that's not to mention the physical pain he's in. And he, he looks down and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the power of the Spirit of God in us. That we can grab the nature and, and release forgiveness instead of accusation. And this, this is what happens at the cross. And so how much more we have to forgive our brothers and sisters. How much more we also ought to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. And we can't do that in our own strength. This is a work of the Spirit of God. Say this is a work of the Spirit of God. And he's working in us mightily. So, you know, here's the thing. In 1 John 3.16, we talk about this, but, you know, the person that closest to you, that, that includes them. Right? And so my wife, actually, I'll give you an example here, is my sister before she's my wife. She's my wife, but she's, she's God's daughter. And she's my sister, and I have, to, I have to be able to relate to her, and I have to be willing to forgive and give up my life for my wife and so sometimes I I don't want to lay down my life I might be upset or offended offended or bitter but but the command is that I need to I need to forgive I need to love I need to lay down my life so if I'm laying down my life for my wife and she's laying down her life for for me guess what there's humility and then unity and then God can begin to build amen because how many know like we haven't arrived. We're on a journey from glory to glory to glory. But I say all that to say that the most important thing to God is relationship. God wants to see our relationships healed. He wants to see our relationships whole. He wants to see the love of God flowing through us. That's what's important to God. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 to 19, it says, Dear children, let us not merely say we love each other. Right? Uh, let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so that we will be confident when we stand before God. Okay? This is, this is what happens. And so here's, here's the four things we learn uh, from these passages. Number one, continue loving one another. Say that with me. I need to continue loving people. Okay? Number two, be willing to lay down your rights for another. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. Be willing to lay down your rights for another. Number three, love through our actions, not only our words. And number four is be tenderhearted, forgiving one another. In other words, we need to model Jesus and we need to share his love. And so God, the Spirit of God causes us to be tenderhearted if we'll yield to the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Amen? But there's a yielding. How many know there's a war going on on the inside, right? We're like, I know I'm supposed to love that person, but can I just hit them first, God, please? And so you have to learn to yield to the fruit, what the Spirit of God is saying, and not to what the flesh is saying. And, it, and, and, and we can't do it in ourselves. It's, it's by the grace of God. Amen? And so we're going to look at that together. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32 says here, Get rid of all bitterness. Does it say some bitterness? All bitterness. 
Because bitterness is like a poison, right? Bitterness will destroy your life. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. So and in order to be kind to one another and tender-hearted, you need to get rid of the hijackers. You got to get rid of these emotions and these feelings that are hijacking you and pulling you out of the plan of God. Bitterness is a hijacker. And it comes and it's in a feeling, it's an emotion that causes you to get angry and then rage is birthed and then rage turns into anger. And then you spout out and you say something to your spouse that you should not have said. How many have done that? Right? And then if you don't deal with it, it turns into slander, which is the next step. All right? So bitterness is this. Bitterness is an emotional feeling of disappointment, okay, at being treated unfairly. That's what bitterness is. It's, it's, it's an emotional feeling of disappointment. How, how many have ever felt bitterness? Kind of like you're disappointed and you're saying, God, I, I forgive that person. But when you see them, you're disappointed. Anybody feel that way? Another definition for bitterness is lack of sweetness. So you know, you know when someone's bitter when you get around them and they're not very sweet. Amen? But God wants us to bring heaven to earth. How many remember the prayer of Jesus? Like, let it be on earth here as it is in heaven. And that means, like, if you were hanging out with people in heaven right now, if you could, like, be transported, do you think they're going to walk around like sour juice? Or do you think they're going to be tender-hearted? Do you think they're going to be sweet? I'm going to guarantee you they're going to be sweet. Because bitterness is not from the kingdom of God. Bitterness is from another kingdom. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's an emotional feeling, and we need to get rid of it because it's a form of temptation. It's the bait of Satan. Satan puts out a hook, and he says, you need to be bitter. And then you grab a hold of that. When you grab a hold of it, now you're going down. You're being pulled away from the fruit of the Spirit into anger, into harsh words, into slander, and it pulls you away from the purpose of God in your life. So we need to get rid of it. And Paul would not have told us to get rid of it if we couldn't get rid of it. It's, it's, it's a hijacker that comes to pull us out of God's plan. You can have bitterness um, against, against uh, actually bitterness that you don't get rid of turns into accusation against others, accusation against yourself, and accusations against God. You know, sometimes people get, they get, they get bitter with God because maybe they're praying for a loved one and that loved one doesn't get saved and they die. And then there's this bitterness, this resentment against God and, and, and it causes these, you're actually angry with God. You need to get rid of that. You need to trust him. Amen. Sometimes you're, you, you're bitter with yourself and it, you, you begin to accuse yourself and say, you know, I'm not worth it. Well, you know, maybe God, God doesn't love me or maybe I'm not called to do this. I'm not very good. Uh, I never did graduate. And you start accusing yourself. And the next thing you know, you're, you're, you're pulled out of the purpose of God. And so God wants us to get rid of it. All right. Bitterness is awful. I'll give you an example. You know, let's imagine, I'm just going to put a name out there. You walk into church one day, and Sue is there. And you run into Sue, and you're going to talk to her, and she kind of looks at you funny, and she walks around you, and she doesn't even notice you. And then all of a sudden, you get this thought. Sue must have an issue with me. And I don't know what it is, but oh, maybe she heard what so-and-so said about what happened to me last week, and that's why she's looking at me that way. That's why she didn't say hi. All of a sudden, now you're thinking... There's something wrong with Sue. So then you're, you're upset inside because you think in your mind you bought a thought that the enemy put out in seed form. You bought a thought that she was angry with you or upset with you or she heard something. And now you build this whole thing up in your mind. And then you go talk to Julie and you say, hey, Julie, I think Susie is backsliding. I was praying about it, and I felt the Lord tell me that, you know, she's backsliding. She's away from the Lord. She, we need to pray for Susie. we got to pray for Susie. And, and you know what? The issue, and so Julie's smart. Julie says, listen, you need to go talk. Let's go talk to Susie and find out what's really going on. Well, I don't want to go talk to Susie because I know that she's upset with me. We better go see Susie. So the, the, the good friend Julie drags you to see Susie, and you start talking with Susie. Susie, do you have an issue with me? Well, why, why would you think that? 
Well, because you, did, you didn't look at me on Sunday. You were like in a daze. You were being rude. Actually, you know what? I couldn't pay my mortgage this month, and I, the bank's going to take my house. And I've been walking around in a daze, and I'm so confused, and I, I'm just discouraged. I'm sorry. I didn't even notice you there. And it's like, you have an aha moment. Ah, I see. What you did was you bought the bait of Satan. You grabbed a hold of an offense because the enemy was speaking to you from another kingdom. The Bible says we have to take every thought captive. Why? Because the enemy uses thoughts to pull us into separation and division. Does that make sense, everybody? Amen. Well, give the Lord a hand. I mean, we're, open, we're just opening up the truth here. And so, so rejection begins, it, it's actually being treated unfairly. And so when you feel rejected, you feel like you're treated unfairly, then bitterness can come in. Bitterness turns to rage and anger and harsh words. But then it says it turns into slander. You know what slander is? Slander is the action of crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. That's what slander is. And so a lot of times people uh, will, 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 because they don't deal with rejection, because they don't deal with bitterness, the next thing you know, they move into speaking accusations against other people. And the enemy loves this. This is the pattern the enemy uses to destroy relationships, especially marriages, is to bring us into false accusations based on a thought that we believed that was from another kingdom. How many hear what I'm saying this morning? Is this clear? Because God wants us to be aware. Did someone say no? I heard no. (laughs) But God wants us to be aware of how the enemy works. This is the pattern of the enemy. He wants to destroy relationships. He wants to destroy marriages. He wants to destroy friendships. And you need to understand the battle is not against flesh and blood. The battle is in the mind in 2 Corinthians. We'll get into that more. But it gets into how the enemy will attack our minds and send thoughts. And that's why Paul says you need to take every thought. Say every thought captive into the obedience of Christ, which means you take the thought, you pull it in, you evaluate it. Does this line it with God's word? Is this what God says about me? Is this what God says about the other person? How does God want me to treat my enemy? No, it's not of God. You cast it out. You evaluate the word and the thoughts with the word of God. Amen? So slander is the enemy's pattern, okay? Love and forgiveness is God's nature. Say that with me. Love and forgiveness is God's nature. It's his disposition. But accusation is the devil's nature. Say accusation is the devil's nature. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, it says this, And then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, It has come at last, salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to the earth. Who, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. The, the nature of the enemy is he's an accuser of the brethren. He's an accuser of God's people. So anytime we choose to accuse another, unless we, unless we know for sure, if we make an accusation based on how we feel or what we think because of something, we come into nature of the devil and we move out of God's nature. And I've made up my mind, I'm going to do my best. I will not side with the devil to accuse brothers and sisters in the Lord. I've just made up my mind. It's done. And sometimes I'm going to fail because I'm human. But at the end of the day, I don't want to work with the devil to break up the body of Christ. I'm done with it. Amen? And so we need to make up our mind that we're not going to do it, okay? In, um, this is the number one way that the enemy gets Christians uh, is, is with accusation. And I, I'm so amazed. It stands out to me. Now, how many ever go online? I'll be watching a sermon or a video that's done about another preacher or another Christian from some denomination or something. And then you start reading the comments and it's Christians saying, well, they're not even saved. And well, they're part of the, they're not part of the remnant. Or this person, you know, this is a false teaching and they're being used of the devil. And these are Christians talking this way. And I was like, I was like, you, you sound like the devil. Really? There's a way to handle it. If you don't agree, hey, listen, I, I don't agree with what you're teaching. I'm praying for you. I love you, brother. You know, read that. You can talk to people. You can correct people without accusing them. Amen? And what the church does, we get caught up, and we start attacking one another and throwing accusations, and we use Scripture to do it. 
The devil does that too, you know that. He uses scriptures to accuse. But we need to love people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 6, we're not going to look it up. But there's a situation in Corinth. And Paul had to address it because there was a, um, there was a man in the church. There's a lot of sexual immorality in the church of Corinth. And there was one man, he, the, Paul says, we don't even see this you know, in the world. This is terrible. This one man is actually sleeping with his, his father's wife. And they were kind of like, well, they weren't dealing with it. And Paul says, you need to deal with this. you got to get this person. You have to confront them. You have to talk to them. And obviously, he didn't repent, so he was put out of the church. Right? you got to get this guy out of the church because he said a little leaven will spoil the whole lump. And there was this whole, like, you know, he, they just pushed him out of the church because he wouldn't repent. How many remember that passage of Scripture? But what a lot of people don't realize is how Paul brought conclusion to that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, look what he says here. I am not overstating it when I say that when a man who caused all the trouble hurt you all more than, than he hurt me, most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Okay. Now, however, it's time to forgive and to comfort him. It's time to forgive and comfort him. Yeah, but, he's sleep, he, but he was sleeping with my father's wife. No, it's time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. See, none of us are perfect. And so people, we're going to make mistakes, but we need to be willing to, to bring people back and restore people. We're so quick as Christians to say, you have an issue and push him away. But there's a time to restore. Amen? Let's look at the next verse. I wrote to you as I did to test you and to see if you would fully comply with my instructions. When you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit. And here's the next verse. So that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with all of his evil schemes. What is the devil trying to do? Bring division. What is God trying to do? Restore and forgive. The enemy's trying to bring accusation. God's trying to bring forgiveness and healing. Wow. I want to look at another story here, how Jesus dealt with the situation. The woman caught in the act of adultery. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 2 to 11. I'm going to read it, and we're going to talk about it. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, this being Jesus, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. When the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in the act of adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, the very act. Next verse. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? So here, here are the religious people saying, well, the Bible says, and he starts quoting scripture to tear this woman's life apart. Okay? They said this, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. In other words, he got down and just started writing. And some, some people believe he wrote the Ten Commandments out. Other people say maybe he wrote their names. I don't know what he wrote, but the thing is, he was ignoring what they were saying. Let's go to the next verse. Was that the last one? So, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And then the next verse says, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Next verse. And then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. Next verse. And Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Next verse. And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen? 
And so I believe that God wants us as a people to learn to recognize when, when accusation wants to come. So we'll put our foot down and say, no, 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 no. I'm not going to partner with Satan against a brother or sister. Does that make sense? Because that's the nature of the enemy, to bring accusation. The nature of God is love and forgiveness. The nature of the enemy is accusation. The Bible says if you have an issue, go to that person. And we see this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 and 17. We're given a clear instruction. If another believer sins against you, has anyone ever sinned against you? I mean, I've been sinned against. Go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Next verse. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed, so there's no accusation, by two or three witnesses. Next verse. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church, and then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan, a corrupt tax collector. So the problem is most of us, we get an accusation or a thought or a feeling that somebody's against us, and we treat them like a pagan and a tax collector. Instead of saying, no, I'm going to go to that person, and I'm going to talk to that person. I'm going to deal with the issue. Amen? That's, that's, that's the way God wants us to do it. There's eight steps to defeating accusation and bitterness. Are you ready? I'm going to listen. Number one, communicate. Number two, communicate. Number three, communicate. Number four, communicate. Number five, communicate. Number six, you can repent because you realize you were wrong. Then you communicate some more and then you repent but that's all it is. It's communicate. And, and what the enemy wants to do is he wants to separate us. And I started this sermon by saying, don't forsake the fellowship of yourself together with the believers of, as many have done because the days are evil. We understand that. Why? Because we need to be communicating. We need to be encouraging. We need to be building one, uh, one another up. We need to be with one another communicating so the enemy will not come in. We have to be aware of his devices. How does he fight us? He sends thoughts. And I, I'm telling you, it happens to me. And I recognize it. I, my wife and I just went to a conference, an MFI conference, and there was a pastor that I was really looking forward to connecting with, and I, we had planned to connect, and there was this, we were going to connect and spend time. And I walked in, and he walked around me. Hey, how's it going? Walked around me, and I thought, well, maybe he's busy. The same gentleman didn't make time for me later in the day and the next morning, and then all of a sudden, I was feeling like there's an issue He's got something against me. And I started, I, 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 I grabbed the thought. And then at the break, I said to my wife, I think he's got spiritual issues. <laughs> he, he must be, there must be something going on. Maybe he heard something about me. And I'm my wife will verify, I'm talking to her like this. And then I caught myself. And I said, no, 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 I'm partnering with the devil. I said, that's, that's ridiculous. I take authority over this. I command these, these, these feelings of rejection, these feelings of um, bitterness that I'm starting to feel. I command them to go in the name of Jesus. And I felt it lift. And then I went directly to him, sat down, hey, let's have a call. We talked. Be but I saw the enemy. See, it happens to pastors too, guys. We're, we're all the same. We, we all got flesh and blood, and we, 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 need, we need acceptance. And so I, I, I just felt like, wow. And I got down, and I started talking to him. I realized what was going on, and I, I, and I saw the enemy coming in to bring division in the body of Christ. That's how he works. So we need to be wise. Okay? Go to that person communicate, and communicate. The other thing is concerning an elder, concerning a spiritual leader. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Why does it say that? Because we're not ignorant of the enemy's devices. He wants to bring division to the body of Christ. So make sure you got your facts, okay? And this is so, so very important. Does this make sense to anybody today? Okay. So God wants, to, wants us to identify and recognize. Um, the enemy wants to come and bring division. You know, about six months ago, I was preaching from this pulpit here, this table, whatever you want to call it. 
And I made an accusation against Hillsong Church New York. And, you know, I, because I, I saw, and some of you might have saw the, the, uh, the interview or the, uh, with Carl Lentz on, how many remember he was, uh, I think it was uh, with, um, what's her name? What's that? No, it wasn't Darling Check. He, he, was, he, was, he was being interviewed by somebody, I can't remember who it was, um, on TV anyway. Uh, Oprah. How could I forget that? Uh, he was being interviewed by Oprah, and he came in and he sat down, and all of a sudden, the, one of the first questions, it was either the first question or the second question, was, was he sat down, and she was like, what do you think about homosexuals, and are they going to heaven, and all this stuff? And he was just like, he was taken back, and he started saying, hey, I'm not here to judge people. It's not my place to judge people, you know, and, you know, God loves them. And he, and he would not say that this was wrong and this is right. He wouldn't draw a line. And, and, and all of a sudden, the church world went nuts and started saying, you know, he, there's an issue with this guy, and he's not serving God, and he's not staying to the truth. How many know what I'm talking about? So I did what the Word of God did. I, well, first of all, I cast accusation, as you all know, and I repented for it. But then I talked to one of the pastors uh, who's connected with a pastor uh, from Hillsong who came and said, Carl was in a, put in a very bad place because right now in New York City, sexual immorality is everywhere. Everybody's sleeping with everybody in New York City. And he said he's got homosexuals by the dozens, they're just coming, they're flocking and he's getting them saved. He's getting them dis- delivered. He's getting them set free. He's, he's mentoring them and counseling them and pulling them, helping them r- realize their true identity in Christ and he's getting them healed so they can walk. In, and, and so he was all of a sudden on TV and he was put on a spot and, he, and they said, if he would have said, no, homosexuals are going to hell or whatever, he said, he would have lost the harvest in New York City. And when I heard that, I thought, you know what? We're so quick. We're so fast to throw accusation and to throw judgment on people. How many hear what I'm saying? So I repent for that because I should have gone to him myself. All right? Lord, help us to discern and recognize every thought. We repent for submitting to the spirit of accusation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, there's one scripture I passed I just want to touch on quickly here. It's um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Can you bring it up there, 2 Corinthians? Yeah, this one. I just want to read it to you. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. Where does reasoning happen? It happens in the mind. Destroy false arguments. Where do arguments start? They start as thoughts. Okay? We destroy every proud obstacle and that keeps people from knowing God. These are ideologies that are not of God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and we teach them to obey Christ. And so it's all, the battle is in the mind. Say the battle's in the mind. And so one of the things we need to learn to discern is what thoughts are coming from my spirit, what thoughts are coming from heaven, and what thoughts are coming from that other kingdom. And that's what maturity is as a believer, right? That's what it says in Hebrews, that those who are mature are those who can discern between good and evil. It's not how many gifts you have or how how long you worship and pray. It's your ability to discern good and evil, what thoughts are coming from God. Whatever thought doesn't sound like a loving father talking to a son and daughter, you can just eject it. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, he will correct us. Yes, he will discipline us. Yes, but he's going to do it with a loving spirit. Okay? I don't say to my kids, I told you not to play on the road, and now I want to teach you a lesson, and have, you know, walk out in the middle of the traffic and get hit by the car. No, I'm not going to do that. And God doesn't do that either. But the enemy comes and he puts his thought, well, God's teaching you something. God's using, he's putting you through a Job experience. You start hearing these thoughts, you're like, wow. And then you, 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 you begin to pull away from the heart of God and you move into deception. Amen? So let's stand together. Did anyone get anything out of this word today? Yes. So I, Travis had asked me actually to tag team preach with him today. And uh, I said no, because he only asked me a couple of days ago. 
<laughs> so, but I do have a couple of small, just two points that I wanted to add on to this because we've been studying this together and God has been working in our, our hearts and lives and he's going to continue to work in our hearts and lives because we can't teach you if we don't get it too. So um, two things, two thoughts I had. Um, I know too, we're building up towards the Highway of Wholeness course. And if you haven't signed up, you need to sign up because it's going to be life changing, life, life transforming. And, you know, we went through a, a course ourselves a couple of years ago and it's been, yeah, sorry, maybe you want to sit for just a minute, sorry. <laughs> and it's been, you know, I, I must say it's been a journey of a couple of years and I still, you know, we, we, we haven't, we won't arrive till we go to heaven, but we're learning how to overcome and that's what God has really brought to our attention, that we need to learn to overcome. And it's not something that you're just going to get overnight, and we can't be discouraged, you know. But I can tell, like, it just, it's just really, it's changing our relationship, and it's changing our lives. But there was a couple of things I wanted to say. So bitterness is actually even a spirit. It's not just a feeling. We're going to be talking more about that and learning more about that in the course. But, uh, and, and there's lots of those spirits that we can be sub sub suspect to if we're not careful. But... Um, communicate you were saying that we need to communicate 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 so you know there's two questions that arose in my heart in this journey and I'm not saying I fully have got it but um, you know the Bible does say you know don't judge unless you because then you'll be judged too but there is a place for judgment you know because there is God is a just God too and there's me judging means measure so we measure it with the word of God and so where we have authority that is where we are called to judge something. Now, we still do it with God's heart and spirit. So, like Travis said, it should sound like a loving father, loving mother, you know, when we do that. So, for example, parents, you know, you're an authority over your children. So, you are called to judge and measure with the word of God and bring some correction. So, within our sphere of authority, we are called to judge. But it doesn't mean we do it in a harsh spirit or manner and stuff like that. So, that's important, you know, that so if somebody is in authority over something, you know, we are called to bring the word of God, bring correction. I mean, we can also speak the word of God, but there's ways to do it. The other thing we learn, too, is we can ask questions, and, and that's a good thing. So when if you have, you know, this tem temptation that Travis was talking about, you know, with an offense or you're wondering if something's going on, you can ask questions, you know. And um, actually, Jesus, I was thinking about Jesus and Peter when Peter had sinned and deny Jesus. You know, look at how he handled it. He went to Peter, and he could have said all kinds of things to Peter, but what, what did he do? He asked questions. He said, Peter, do you love me? And you know, Peter already knew where he was coming from, right? It already convicted him. Of, and of course, Jesus is an authority. I mean, he was, he's God, but he asked him, do you love me? You know, and it was enough for Peter to get the point. And he asked three times, you know, but Jesus modeled for us what we are to do when there's something coming up that we need to deal with. You know, go and ask a question. You know, for when, and it's funny too, like we're, we're people of habits, you know. So many times we're not ill-willed, we're just, we're people of habits too. And sometimes, I mean, we perish because of lack of knowledge. So we do need knowledge. But then I remember even when I had gone to this course for my life and we were learning about accusation. They spent a whole class about it. And I came home and... Because we're people of habit, I'm not saying Travis was ill, well, I've done it too. He spewed out some little accusation to me, and I, I stopped like this. And I said, hold on a minute, I can't agree with that anymore. And he goes, oh, good. <laughs> you know, and that's how simple it can be, right? We have to change our habits. And in the next time, it might be him doing that to me, right? And sometimes we get upset. For me, if you're like me, you're going to be upset with yourself because... <laughs> One of my strongholds is self. You can be self-accusing too. So when you feel like you've failed the other person or done the wrong, it's like, oh, you know. So anyways, but we're going to dig into these topics in the highway to wholeness, and it's part of overcoming, and it's, yeah. Anyways. Thank you. That was awesome. I told you you'd get up and share. See? She did, there you go. So, um, no, and this is the thing. In this kind of stuff, when we're talking about wholeness, we're talking about holiness, that kind of stuff, you need to realize that sometimes it's two, it's two steps forward and you get knocked back a step. And then it's two steps forward and you get knocked back a step. But the, the, at the end of the day, you're moving forward. Amen? And, and, and that's what it's all about. Because the enemy would want to come and accuse you and say, well, you're not measuring up. Pastor Travis talked about accusing and now you're accusing somebody. And, and then all of a sudden you're back into that cycle. Amen? So it's not about having it all together because the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. 
the, 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 you know, the spirit of the letter brings life. What does that mean? It means that the spirit of God gives us the aha moment, right? The, ah, oh, okay, I get it. So now I know the enemy's plan, so I'm going to work at not letting him have place. Amen? doesn't mean you're not going to fall. Does, so don't let the enemy accuse you. I mean, one of the reasons why we didn't share together fully is because we had an argument yesterday, and she refused to, you know, and it was kind of like I got knocked back a step. Amen? But then we made up afterwards, but then it was too late for her to prepare, so she didn't come. You see? So this is life. Say, this is life. So, I, you, you know what I'm saying? So, we're all, we're all on a journey. We're going to get knocked back. But what you don't want to do is when you get knocked back, you don't want to stand. You don't want to listen to the enemy come and say, see, you don't got it. See, the Spirit of God's not resident in you. See, you don't have the authority you think you have. No, you say, no, devil. I got knocked back, but I'm stepping up, and I'm going forward again. Amen. And next time, I'm going to have victory. And that's all you do. It's a journey, and it's the Spirit of grace. It's the glory of God that he's given us that empowers us to walk this thing out in Jesus' name. Amen? Why don't we stand? I'm going to close in prayer. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Say, Heavenly Father, help me to recognize when bitterness is rising up in me. Help me to recognize when that spirit of accusation is coming to accuse me. Give me grace, Lord, and by your spirit, help me to align myself with your nature, which is love and forgiveness, not accusation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.